Fine. I'll start again. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the Long Range Planning Committee meeting of June 14th, 2020. Um, we do have some Zoom members today, which is great. And I will start with a roll call. And then I don't think we have any new members to recognize. No, not today. No. Uh, Alan Paul? Here. Rick Shane? Present. Peter Freilinger? Here. Robin Saunders? Here. Portia Hershman? Here. Robert Odlin? Judith Fisher? Rachel Hendrickson? Here. Jean Marie Katerina? And John Anderson? Here. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Judy might join us. She emailed if she could uh, join in on Zoom, so she might get on okay. later. Uh, off off uh, agenda here a little bit, but I did reach out again to. Tody. Okay. And she's doing something. I'm not sure what exactly she's trying to do, but she said she'd get back to me once she had a, okay. had any new word. Yeah, I know she reached out to Robert to see if he was still interested in being on the committee because he hasn't been here since yeah. December. Yeah, and for the rest person. of the committee, this is Robin Oglin. Do we need one more person to become a member? Or? It's Well, it's a matter of um, how they handle his position. Right, because all possible. Ultimately, you have to submit an application, then go through the whole appointments process. Um, and he, I don't pass that. I couldn't. No, even, no, he was no, appointed he, in this November, and he came to a meeting in December, and he hasn't been attended. Yeah. So he's technically. Oh, we need it. to read. We need to he, see what's going on. It's just three meetings. Three meetings of committee, within, three meetings on committee within a year, and you right to really your position. Yeah, well, particularly if there's no notification. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Especially. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, next item on our agenda this morning is review the minutes of May 10th of 2024. Corrected Peter's name. Yes, so right. other than that, yeah. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other comments? If not, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Is there second. a second? Second. I think I was the first person I heard was. Worship. Portion. Oh, portion. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, item number three this morning is to review farm stand and farm store uses in the rural farming district and potential recommendation to the ordinance committee. Autumn? Yeah. So last time we talked about. Um, the request that we received to consider how it really stemmed around Beale's ice cream wanting to go in um, the existing ice cream shop. But in that discussion, there seems to be a way that we could address that pretty easily. So I put together a draft amendment for you guys to look at. Um, it would essentially take away the 51% with a special exception requirement for uh, the farm stand and agricultural product stores only in the RF district. So I'll share my screen so we can look at it together. So this is, I just included this section so you can see the description of the districts. But essentially the use table, we would add a special exception um, to both of this, both of these uses. And then within the performance standards for farm stands, we would add if the farm stand will not meet the 51% threshold, a special exception is required. Um, it only applies to properties located in RF, and then all other performance standards could be met. So it'd be a, an outlet um, for people to request. A special exception. Why only the RF district? Mm -hmm. this because always because farm stands and agricultural product stores are already a special exception in R2. Mm -hmm. And then a contract zone in RFM. Oh, I see. They're not. Right. They're not I, admitted. It's only RF. I've got the color wine red right thing going on. Gotcha. The P, the P is, um, yeah. Okay. So this would permit the request to be made. 
to the Board of Appeals and they would have to meet all the special exception requirements and it would be more of a, a way for that to be, you know, that could be um, based on their extenuating circumstances or the particulars of that site. So I did the same thing for the agricultural product stores. Um, that's really it. It would allow the ask to be made for those two uses. I have started to do this use this year. I believe that they have figured out a way to keep the ownership okay. Okay. for okay. this year, okay. but this would be for everyone to be able to do it. Um, is there any other red text I should be aware of here? That, um... No, it's only on number seven. Okay. The okay. Thank you. And so if this is something that you all are in agreement uh, to, we could ask for a motion and move it to the committee and put it into place. Yeah, so ultimately, if we agree to this, it goes to the ordinance committee, the ordinance committee then does their thing, and then ultimately the council would need to approve the ordinance change. Right. I'll go to council, then planning board for a public hearing, and then back to council for final yeah. approval. All right. So it just goes to the process. <laughs> right. All right. Move that we recommend. Yeah, I, I have a question. And, and is there an upper percentage past which we're looking at uh, a professional group coming in, a uh, business group coming in and basically setting up in what was the farm stand? In other words, what what's the uh, what's the line? What would be the line between a farm stand with some other stuff? and a uh, farm stand that really isn't one anymore because another company is working it. Number five, I would think we take care of it. Yeah, you have the limitation on the size, Rachel. So I think that would help, you know, but again, yeah. that doesn't prohibit a company from coming in and wanting to run their soap business, say on Harmon's farm, but they would have to go through the special exception and they would be limited by the size. Um, so, and then the special exception process has to, they have to look at, um, there's parking and water and existing uses in the neighborhood. So there's quite a few other things they would have to go through in that process. So at this point, there's no upper limit to it. It would be open. And I will say that um, I would prefer it that way because we already have a hard time. I don't want to look at folks' financial records really to determine where their revenue came from. That's, That's really, oh, I don't know what authority I've really, or even yeah, and, and, practicality yeah. of somebody giving that to us and, is. And again, part of it is, 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 are you running a 400 square foot soap stand or are you running a 400 square foot um, auto parts store? Um, or or whatever you want to put in there, it's it's. I think number a, five pretty much covers it. Can you know about the kind of products? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think the zoning board can figure this out. I think pretty so. Early. I'm not worried about that quality, quality of judgment. Yeah, because your products would still have to be, um, you know, grown, raised products or made, right. handmade right. sort of yeah. things. Yeah. <laughs> Four hundred square foot things selling cheese. I love <laughs> that. That'd be great. Government <laughs> cheese, maybe not, but. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I'm just concerned that when it gets to the planning board, we we have got some clear guidance. Well, the special exception gets to you, we get to the zoning board. Yeah. You, I don't think you would see these, Rachel. This would just go, the special exception would go to the Board of Appeals zoning board, and then um, it would do, a, has a minor site plan review. And then the farm stand uh, is a permit from our office. So this, these would not come to the planning board. They don't come to planning board now. Well, um, I, it just seems to me, and I'm being cranky because I'm exhausted. The um, <clears throat> at some point, it, it's not a farm stand; it's something else. So I just wanted to make sure <clears throat> there were enough guidelines, and it could be at some point that instead of going to the staff, it would come to the planning board. No, it goes to the zoning. It has to go to the zoning board first for a special exception over the fifty-one percent. Right. Right. I understood, but then then the guidelines for for what happens next. 
In other words, well, but then you say you don't trust the zoning board to make flawed standards in, in terms of. Well, it goes to the yeah uh, the zone. in terms of parking and stuff like that. Well, Rachel, we have to consider that as part of the special exception request as well, along with other uses in the neighborhood. There's a, a list of, I believe, eight checklist items for the special exception. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so we're already doing that. Parking and other things. I, I, yep, parking. I remember, um, effect um, effect on public safety. experience of a cafe on Route 1. Uh, that wasn't an exception. Anyhow. That was not a special exception request, Rachel. Mm hmm So the farm stand rules themselves already have um, some standards that are in place now, and then the additional would go through the board. Um, Let's see, this is an RF issue, not a, a, a Route 1 zoning issue. Mm -hmm. um, this is a special exception issue, not a permitted use issue. So you're not getting this until the zoning board has already approved, has already approved the special exception request which includes the issues you're talking about. And they have to meet all of the other requirements. Correct. So it's still that limited size, um, yep. no parking, pulling out onto the road, that like, the products have to be legitimate. And we notify neighbors, yep. um, all the stuff that we normally use in the zone board. Yep. So Portia made the motion, was it Robin to second, second it? Uh -huh. okay. Okay. So we have a motion on the table. Any other discussion? Because of the I think I mentioned last meeting that I'm sure I'm not the only person that's friends with Susan before the person, ah. but so I'm going to abstain. You're, you're abstain. Okay, thank you. We still have quorum. We're still good. We're still good. We have quorum. All so, right. Yeah. Any other discussion? No. No. If not, all in favor? Robin. Robin. <laughs> <Yeah>. Just Harris. <laughs> all right. So that would be in it. Okay, great. Thank you. And we'll forward that on to the ordinance committee and I'll keep you posted. Thank you. Number four, continue the review and discussion of concerning existing parking standards. Bob, uh, excuse me. Bob. Yeah, so last time we had a lot of good discussion and I had included several attachments and reading. And so this time I just included um our existing standards and then highlighted some sections that I think we should probably focus on first. And then I really just am looking to you all for some more guidance on how you want to approach this. Um, we talked a little bit about doing it in different areas. I do think um, since the budget has passed, I have some money that I am considering putting out maybe a baby RFP for Oak Hill work. Yeah. And maybe it's more of a focus on streetscape and parking and things like that. And maybe I can get a little bit of architecture. I'll have to see what I can get out of it. I, I, I would, uh, given the discussion we had last time, I think even just street state, uh, streetscape and parking, which I will not say three times, fast, <laughs> um, would be great. And I think that would be a great test case for what might then from what might... through to Dust, Dunstan mm -hmm. or other areas. So. Yeah, because I think we could probably use a lot of the same information. What I, I mean this with love for Scarborough, but when I come, I don't see a lot of, you know, summer, you see a lot of beautiful landscaping. Mm -hmm. The environment gets so much different in Maine and we just are lacking that a little bit. You and I say it loud enough. Uh, I agree. Um, <laughs> I want it to be more aesthetically <laughs> pleasing. Um, and so Oak Hill like seems to be a way that we could perhaps address some aesthetics and the streetscape yeah. and shared parking. And we could, I envision doing a charrette. You know, if you looked at a, a, a visual of the Oak Hill and Hannaford's and all that, you could really figure out some pretty interesting ways to make things connect. I've driven in there before and we can't get over there. Are you kidding me? Thank like, you. really? Yeah. Why? Thank you. Yeah. And so I feel like I was exactly you think that? Yeah, and, and, That's not the way to go. And, yeah. and, and so I think that might be a really good test case for us to That'd be great. do some things. So I'm going to move forward with that and see as what I can get with that money. Um, but in the meantime, we still have parking that applies to the rest of the town. And restaurants is definitely one of our sticky ones. Um, I don't know if some of these are interesting because they're 
gross floor area or your least area. There's a lot of nuances that maybe we could simplify, but restaurants is one that I think we should probably talk about. Um, and then we've talked about this before that the planning board doesn't <laughs> have the authority to waive parking requirements, but you have to be able to show them in a landscape area. Mm -hmm. And so they can come back and that seems counterintuitive because we'll have people put use their landscaping for future parking if they really need the parking and we've had that actually um be used we have at dunston um they had an area and they only reserved it in landscaping for about three months and then they just parked it so that's a weird requirement yeah. it would my memory mm -hmm. is it your concern that we have excess parking or lack of parking well it's both um, so in some instances, we have excess, some instances, we don't have a maximum and in some instances we have not enough. So like restaurants, we, some of those restaurants, maybe we need to break out by categories a little bit more. We talked about because those quick turnover or sit down coffee shops have different, um, Mm -hmm. It also depends on whether they're in strips or whether yeah. they are separate. solo kind mm -hmm. of things, and that shared parking. Um, you know, and that was the other issue we had last time: the shared parking. Mm -hmm. Can you, you know. have, have, whether it's in a strip mall or whether it's in like adjacent areas that have separate parking requirements? There's bleed over into the yeah. that. And so there's yeah, there's both both mm -hmm. end on the minimum and maximum. Mm -hmm. Do we need to incentivize shared parking at all? I just worry that like some parking lots, cool. tell me if it's not an issue. Do we have that some parking lots are private? Well, I'm not sure that it's incentivized. We have a bunch of parking lots that can't connect. Right. Um, and that happens at Oak Hill. It's the, the new um, uh, Evergreen uh, Credit Union by the mobile on Route 1. Um, it has an area where it could go over to the the, the um, uh, El Rodeo, but it doesn't connect right now, so it kind of inhibits the idea of sharing those parking lots. But you could it, walk over. There, right? You could, yeah. You could just it's, park there and then walk over the curb. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, what I'm worried about is whether or not Evergreen Credit Union would say no, you can't park here, El Rodeo customers. I think we have seen that, um, and again, I think this is going to be no kill, like the um, uh, um, the Town and Country FCU parking area has signs saying that this is exclusively for Town and Country FCU. Now there's no gate or anything like that, but there are these signs. The so, one right over here. Yeah, the yeah the not the one over the one the oh, sort of executive office. office. Yeah, okay. back there. Um, Part of it may be cameras too. Yeah, they want to be able to monitor mm -hmm. their parking lot for intrusion into the building. I don't know. Yeah, that. Um, so I think yeah, there's a. I just don't want us to get caught up by sort of a, a landowner that won't share their spaces. And so I was thinking, do we need to incentivize that in some way? Because it's an issue in uh, other municipalities. And how do, how do they incent? No, they don't. No, I just keep building more parking. Right, yeah, exactly. I think I want to. I'd love to hear the results of the charrette that she's talking about because I think Oak Hill is the area where we yeah, currently see the most of the issues, and it would be good to. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I think the thing that concerns me I is. Sit here. Just... Oh, you can it's sit anywhere you want. <laughs> it is open. We had seating. <laughs> Did you guys solve all of it while I was out there? Yeah. All the world. Awesome. <laughs> they, they were doing great until I thought of something. But, oh, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, actually, I think that my concern is that with mobility of people today, it scares me to think that in, in most situations, there's only one car per quarter mm -hmm. or when you get into a situation when people are going, and I'll take Pat's Pizza, for example, Tuesday nights, I think, is their trivia night or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, everybody who comes has their own car. It, it's what it feels like. So I think that there are some of the 
counts that you're suggesting here? I haven't suggested um, these are oh, that's today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not making but I'm, but... I'm, I just think those well. But they can park at the bank next door. Yeah, Pat's is a great example, though. They can, uh, like, trivia that happens when the banks are closed and when the floors are closed. Right. And they're, they share that, that the same block pop. I get that. But when you have, look at none such broke. Mm -hmm. They had to build a parking lot, mm -hmm. lot across the street. And even though I I can't remember now if they actually put a crosswalk in there. No, they it's didn't. Required. They haven't done it yet. And you would also think that they should put in lights like they have on They're required. Black well, Road. they just haven't yeah. done them yet. <laughs> I'm holding a performance day. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> if they don't do what they're supposed to do, but they're using the facility, I think somebody should put a barricade across that entryway. And force them to do it. I mean, if they're if they're supposed to do it, why did they get a you know well, if it, there were a CEO or something? Sure they, oh. Yeah, we're that's not that specific thing is being handled as much okay. as possible. Well, but the reason it's highlighted is because our parking requirements for restaurants is too low for solo yep. sites. Yes. Okay, right for All standalone right. sites, our parking requirements are too low. We okay. need to look at those. All right. And yes. I think last time I had included some examples of what other places had. Some of them were right on par, some were much higher. So I think we need to get to a better. And this, I will tell you, this counting chair thing is for the birds. Mm -hmm. I am at restaurants counting chairs, and that is not a good use of my time, nor is it as soon as I walk out, they just pull the extra chairs out. So what is the point of that, right? I mean, there's an occupancy load for the fire marshal. But for me to say, you only have 10 chairs you can put out here, and I'm going to have to come by every day and count them, yeah. is, and I've done that, is silly. So I would like something a little bit more generic that we can well, one thing I'll achieve. Observe, like all, yeah. uh, one thing I'll observe here is that you use a great word, which is standalone. Um, I don't see the word standalone here. I mean, no, no. It, standalone would be a good modifier for, for maybe for, 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 for so these are the standards for standalone um uh build or buildings that are constructed on a standalone basis for this purpose yeah or there's no other parking that right, right. exactly um and, and then we would have a section that would describe where the building is not shares uses with other uh stuff and do they have an agreement yeah yeah they would have to have an agreement. Agreement. that's yeah. that's i guess where yeah. i was going with that whole um, and then we can allow one the ones that are standalone but adjacent to have create agreements that would allow for sharing of parking. So I think that uh, I think that makes sense. And Maybe. for multiple reasons, it allows them to not have to put down as much asphalt. Right. right. Yep. Is there a way to have the shared agreement run with land? Oh, well, it's usually with the site plan approval. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's, yeah, it does. It's that. part of that. That's what we okay. when we look at it. So you could have, let's see, you could have standalone standards and say, maybe I'm just putting numbers out there for ease. Right. So it's 10 parking spaces for every thousand square feet. So that's standalone. Sure. And then your standalone adjacent can have um, a reduction up to a certain percentage, maybe of shared parking. And then your restaurant in a facility, maybe it goes down to like five per thousand, so something like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, something and, that there's some, some for some reason. Some Hello, reason can, I, can I talk about shared parking for a moment? Because it's I think it's relevant here. Yeah. <clears throat> when the uh, fire station, the fire commons, whatever it was, uh, came in, we were sold on a concept of shared parking, um, and there was therefore a certain number of spaces. You know, we calculated the. The stores are open at such and such a time, closing at such and such a time. The business is closed. People come back from work and they into the best apartments, and it should work. Uh, and then they put um, they they put a pizzeria in there, whose hours also uh, went right over the time that people were coming home from work uh, and into the night. So I don't know if that has created a problem, but a change of use all of a sudden raises questions of what do you mean by shared parking? Because now I'm not sure how 
how shared it is. But uh, Autumn, I'm, I'm sure you're taking a look at that because I think we might have mentioned it before. Uh, so it would be really helpful to have some definitions, guidelines, and other things for, for shared parking. What happens when there is a change of use that affects the shared parking? And maybe um, when we do shared parking at the site plan process, there's a threshold that we have to have an average. So we take the lowest use, which is usually, well, they're all pretty similar. So retail and offices are three to four per, and then we take the restaurant, maybe that's the 10 per thousand. And then we do an average and that's what we require for a strip center. So you can have some flexibility and some, um, you know, if it's a bigger facility. And that's fine when it's new development. Yeah. You're dealing with the developer. But when you're talking about like 10 years later and the developer is poof, gone yeah. and whatever you have decided with the developer is now a, a property management issue mm -hmm. and a tenant a ten yeah. issue. Yeah. And I guess if you were to... Because what so, if they all became restaurants? You know? Right, right. Um, well, if you did it where it was... If you required a a parking review for a change in use, a change of use, yeah. um, at a certain point, if you had all parking, the last restaurant probably would not be allowed. Right, right. It probably yeah. would, would. I just want us to talk about yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Like it's really it's been tricky with existing because stormwater is property yeah. management yeah. Issue and soon parking will become yeah. That. And we just needed to run with the land. Mm -hmm. we'll continue mm -hmm. here. Yes, I've done a number of these. So it's and what the agreements generally they first of all they don't run with the land unless they say they run with the land. Right. But they all are drafted to say essentially this shared parking arrangement is unique to the current situation. If one or more of the shared parkers parking establishments to change, then they have to revise the agreement. So. One that comes to mind that was the most complicated was up in Augusta, and it was a shared parking between a, an elderly um, resident's home and the, I forget the name of the, the diocese as a big facility there. They used the same parking lot. And the shared parking there was permitted by the planning board because the evening parking were the residents of the, of the, um, the, the, the residential facility, the diocese facility, primarily daytime, but the planning board approved that agreement. And there was a condition in the approval that essentially said, if either of these uses change, you've got to come back to the board. Mm -hmm. And it could be that the new use in one of those would mess up the shared parking and they'd have to do something else. So they don't tend to run with the land because they tend to be unique to the uses in place at that time. So do you think, like in that particular instance, that seems like it is very unique, but would you think if we did, if we had a brand new um, shopping center that went in, well, they wouldn't need shared parking. Oh, um, I would think that the conditions of approval would, would just require the something to use. the effect that parking is, shared parking is approved for this project as it's presented, right. in the event a change, change. of use. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it may not even be a change of use. Yeah. Anything that changes the, the nature of the parking, the- What would trigger, what would back trigger that business. review, Rick? Well, What's that? What would trigger that review? Well, say, for example, you had a parking lot that served three restaurants. Probably would require a fair amount of parking. Right. Well, no, that's the other one. Suppose the parking were a restaurant and two small office buildings. Then one or more, more of those office buildings gets converted to a restaurant. That probably is going to affect the amount of parking required. And if there's a shared parking agreement in place that related to the one restaurant and two office buildings, then I would think the planning would say, you got to come back to us. Because we approve parking based on the current uses. Now you're making two of the three uses more intense. You may not meet our requirement, parking requirements, given those uses. And Isn't it, there something well, in the ordinance about a change of use? Yeah, but I think to Portia's point, 
So oftentimes you'll have a landlord and they have a vacancy and they just lease it, right? right. So, so you have a business so and you the, you get your um, it could be a daycare it, and you go daycare. into the business, right? And unless we catch you or somebody tells you, what oftentimes people just don't know, and you would have to do a certificate certificate of occupancy review, right? But then that person's already. Assigned. least and everything and then and we get that a lot so i'm trying to come up with a way to prevent that like if the use changes cool it, it, for some areas and i'm trying to come a up business license trigger we don't have a business license requirement really? no so right so, so if i buy an office building uh -huh. and i want to convert it to no nope. restaurant don't i have to if you want to if you want to change that exterior changing the use you're just going to get a certificate of occupancy that's then a, that should trigger a site plan right. but what i'm saying is if you buy an office building and you don't know or don't ask and no one finds out you can and then it's an after the fact and we have those battles right and if there's nothing saying that you have to get a business license then it, it's, no it's a hard it's a lot of people know and a lot of people don't know I mean, legitimately, just don't know. Um, That's like, what do you think the landlord should know? <laughs> I, I, I'm just. I think a lot of things should happen, in our <laughs> but I am continually disappointed in humanity about. But I'm just saying, I always try to. Um, it's it's awful, but I'm always trying to think of like worst case, lowest common denominator, you know, yeah. to, yeah. just to capture things. The, what I'm struggling with is the change of use piece, yeah. right? Because the example would be you could have an existing restaurant and they serve from, they serve dinner from five to nine, pick an hour, right? But they leave. Mm -hmm. Another person com could come in without a change of use, but actually be open lunch. for breakfast and lunch. Sure. So, my if I get my restaurant through and I say we're only open for four to ten, and then I sell it to you and you serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yep. It might be easy to change your use. I don't know. That could cause another problem in another I, area. But I, I just, I, I think back to our thing, it might be deemed a change of use, but the owner, the landlord would all legitimately complain. But even it's, it's still a restaurant. It's kind of. Yeah. It sounds like the onus is on staff. Yeah, to catch these go things, catch things, which is that, completely backwards. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out a way. So I, I want people still to come and do their certificate of occupancy review for a change in use, but I'm trying to figure out a way um, it that it, it's that it's okay. Like, so your site plan, and we have this in some things. Um, where your site plan is approved for this many use this many square feet for retail this many square feet for restaurants and so you come in but those people generally know what they're doing <laughs> i don't know i'm trying to solve a lot of problems and, yeah. you know, yeah. different yeah um, there's especially there, there's for new construction i think you've got a number of tools that you could apply yes mandate that the planning board always have a demand that the owner notifies staff of any change of use or change of tenancy. I guess I think that's too much. But otherwise, for, for uh, otherwise me, you're asking staff to do the search for, for, well, for themselves or, yeah. or citizens to I do the- the CO is required and that's a staff, we go in, we inspect, we make sure they that's still have everything. Everything is basically no. already done. Because the yeah. planning board really, if the use is allowed in the zoning district, and they have an approved site plan, and we've approved the site plan that allows parking that's appropriate for all of the uses that could go in, then they should well, if, be able if to it's approved change for the all of the uses, then we don't have a problem. That's what I'm trying to like get to well, this average sort of all thing. All the uses allowed in that zone I mean, means you're going to have a maximum out the amount of parking. You'd have like a maximum and a minimum, right? No, you'll never have the minimum. Asphalt you have to approve it. No, no, I'm, I'm saying that our range could be within that but the minimum reason, and the maximum. The only reason the minimum it. works is because we assume a set of uses. The maximum works without any assumption. The minimum mm -hmm. has to assume a blended mix of uses that offset one another, that allows for something other than the maximum. 
I I think I'm losing. Um, so I want to, I would like to change the restaurants. I'd like to divide those up kind of like what we've talked about and then have different requirements for restaurants based mm -hmm. on what they are used. And then but still, can I stop you? Yeah, yeah. But then still, how are you regulating that though? If, and, and getting people to work together to share their parking, if after it's built, people come in and put the restaurants after the fact, whether it's standalone or whether it's, well, you would, have, you would have to, if you had, say, the Cabela site, say that's a big site with a lot of parking. So you have to get a shared agreement between, I guess, the owners to be able to use the parking. But we're but talking I mean, about an ocean of asphalt there. Yeah. yeah I, mean, yeah, I think yeah. we could talk more like, <laughs> you know, like where Kieran is, you know, like the, um, the little yeah. sushi place or uh, something like that, where you, you have a, a discrete amount of parking. Uh -huh. And then how, how, do, how do you share it? And then what if every one of them becomes an ice cream shop or, mm -hmm. or, 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 or whatever? I think, I, I think um, we may... It, it, and I think as we think about mixed use development going forward, that's going to be the problem we face yep. more and more. It's not going to be the Cabela's problem. Yeah. yeah. And the Cabela's problem is exactly what you were talking about. We just maxed everything out. Right. Throw as much asphalt as you can. Yeah. And to your point, that's what I'm trying to get to, this mixed-use parking requirement. So it doesn't have to come to the planning board because I want right. to lease my space I, out. I and I want to definition. always keep tenants in. I, I think mixed-use, though, by definition, either places a heavier upfront burden on you as a developer mm -hmm. to monitor your, your 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 use within the scope of a mixed-use But plan. developers don't do that. Correct. I'm, no, just, developers walk away. Well, landowners, I should say. Landowners. Because there's always going to be a landowner. Um, if, or... And this, there's no on that one. Or, yeah, as a planning staff, you've got a much higher enforcement and monitoring burden. That's right. Which we're trying to alleviate. Yeah. And I think what I'm saying, what I'm observing is, I'm not. I think it's, it's maybe a combination of the two. But you're you're going to have a higher burden of mm -hmm. one, as as we have this sort of qualitative or ongoing monitoring of use. Mm -hmm. Some higher burden. Of, well, it may get down to um, having different requirements in different zoning areas, too, mm -hmm. because yeah. one of the things we've looked at on Route 1 is how do we eliminate more curb cuts? Yeah. So how now do we have sure, shared access and egress, um, which then starts to force the shared parking mm -hmm. issue because you've got traffic going not on one, but in an alternative yeah. lane versus somebody out you know, in the Western part who wants to put up wow. a little restaurant or a little yeah. grocery store yeah. or something. That's very different. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking also, um, I had a church building and we sold it to a child care center. Very different use. And yet the parking and so on was also equivalent. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's, you can have a change of use that doesn't change your parking mm -hmm. requirement necessarily. But I think it's important to also think about where it's located. Yeah. And, and right. as you layer those qualitative decisions on the things, you end up having a qualitative referee that has to mm -hmm. get started. I, I think we should look at this in different ways. Mm -hmm. So one way I think we should look at it is what should the parking be on new development? And then the second way I think we should look at this is how do we deal with change of use? Yeah. Because they're two totally different things. We can control new development mm -hmm. very easily through the planning board uh, and with whatever our new ordinance says. Mm -hmm. As I'm listening to everybody talk, I think our biggest struggle is what do we do with change yeah. of use? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... We, we should probably segregate this and deal with it in two different fashions. I don't know if there's a third <laughs> that we need to deal with it, but I think we should definitely look at those two. The one thing I was just hearing this conversation, but I think as this gets developed, should be considered on looking at Pushy's helmet, is you know, we're kind of assuming, my assumption is we're assuming the behaviors are people are still driving their cars, and we also as a town want more mobility, walkability, biking. So to some extent, to what degree do we want a little bit of parking pain to kind of help push other modes of transportation? 
So to me, to some degree, a little bit of pain is okay if we're successful at actually doing things with if you like can get there by bike. Yeah, if you can get there by bike. So it, it also depends on like people. That's on Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Compartmentalize, yeah. 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 I've been arguing this since probably 2004 now. Mm -hmm. And before we're ever going to get to that point where walkability and everything else starts to make sense, and nobody wants to hear this. Now, I'll take the town council probably number one. We got to increase our density in areas in order to make that work. Yeah, we we talked a little bit about that. I want to say maybe last fall, mm -hmm. right here in Oak Hill, trying to up our density, up our limits right. on yeah. building heights, and that was not well received. Mm -hmm. Someone um, came in and limited us. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. and so. Right. I want. I think everybody wants that, mm -hmm. but we're never going to get there with our current ordinances. And it's still until we yeah. start to increase that. And, and we, we say it's a priority. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 uh, and, and there's a political will behind yeah. it, right? And it's right. not a chicken and egg issue. It's you've got to start with density because density then creates the demand for for public transit, public transit yep. or more trails or um or that'd be great yeah. and, and, yeah. And, and, and then suddenly you don't have the demand for parking which means you can now put your parking standards with a reduced standard mm -hmm. so there's it's it isn't about chicken and egg it's starting with density mm -hmm. um but i do think that we before alan paul so but one of the things we did, we, we talked about while you we were out of the room um, on, on was just the idea that this um, Oak Hill Charette actually could mm -hmm. give us a lot of insight into it. And I think it, 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 well, the reason I wanted to stop and do it now is including into the density argument. As we see yeah. that, mm -hmm. what happens from, a, from the top down to the, the parking areas, to the, to the street standards, the curb standards, things like that, we can start to say, aha, and now, Mr. Uh, helpful town councilman, this is why we need denser standards here because Oak Hill can support it. If we yeah. design Oak Hill well, we're ready for this in the center of town. And so. the more density and higher, as, as I've talked about before, gives you more green space too, right. yeah. which then makes a more walkable, yeah. pedestrian, yeah. biking friendly mm -hmm. kind mm -hmm. of environment. Yep. It's better for stormwater, it's yep. better for yep. aesthetic, everything. And, and I just would, would like to add my my sort of, my leaning toward minimum and maximum kind of thing is I, I'd really like to alleviate the burden from the staff mm -hmm. level, but that means we have to put the burden somewhere else, mm -hmm. which may mean it has to go to, sorry, Rachel, planning board, where you jump, don't just visualize mm -hmm. the project that's in front of you, but you've got to look 50 years into the future. <laughs> and, you know, everybody has issued a crystal ball, right? When they get on the planning board, you should bring, I still have mine. Um, but you have to think into the future and think that, like, cars just, they're always going to be here. Mm -hmm. But we've got to think about not just cars, but what businesses are going to come in, even though it's, it's right now maybe a Cabela's or whatever. What do you think they're doing at the mall right now with, you know, the retail space becoming a thing of the past, mm -hmm. you know? So I think we've just got to. <clears throat> yep. Rachel, I got you. Yeah, I, I, this is kind of off topic, but the, um, wait a minute. Okay. Uh, some of this reminds me of what happened at the University of Rhode Island years ago when everybody was complaining there wasn't enough parking. Um, so the university went out and restriped the parking lot and parking lots. And by God, all of a sudden there was enough parking. Um, we don't really require, I don't believe that parking lots be restriped. I'd like to see at Oak Hill, uh, if those spaces were restriped, would we get more parking? Because right now, if they're not restriped, people park where they want to, and they may be taking up two extra spaces either side. So I don't know whether that's something code looks like, or we simply say, you know, every four years, every five years, uh, you restripe, or every time that you you cannot see where the lines are, you restripe. But uh, something that says you really have to keep your parking lots in good shape, and that includes restriping. 
we used to have a code that said parking spaces had to be 10 by 20. That was changed. Right. It's now nine by 18. Yep. So I don't yeah, know. Probably get yeah. more space. So, so yeah, there people, are spaces yeah, people change are, that. there are still spots where they're 10 by 20. The so, irony is the vehicles have gotten larger. And yeah. they continue to get larger. Well, and so drivers as have gotten your, your cars are here still look smaller than where. Yeah. But, but yeah. my point <laughs> is, between between trucks, and vehicles yeah, are getting yeah. bigger rather than smaller. Yeah. And so, you know, if you've got a nine foot space like over in front of Harbor Fish, you got to be real careful about who you park next to and who well, open next to you. Yeah, yeah. Nine, nine by eighteen is national standard. We, well, yeah. it's tight. You got a big there. truck. Figure it's it tight. Out. But, I mean, I used yeah. to drive a suburban. It's like yeah. you have to figure it out. But they aren't all nine feet anyway. Yeah. Um, I, I just think as cars get bigger, I think to your point, Rachel, though, is evaluating if you have a, a change in the um, parking width, it is going to affect obviously the total number of spaces that you have available. Um, I just don't know, again, it gets down to that enforcement issue. I think in the world of nudge arguments, um, uh, I, I think Alice had a great idea, just maintenance of the parking lots in their in the correct form probably will make a material difference. Um, but I think the long-term, issue doesn't go away. We're, we're, we're saying here is that use drives parking demand. You survive and, and, and therefore either planning board or planning staff need to have a monitoring and enforcement role in use in a way which is not normally contemplated in our, in our ordinances. And so, and yeah, I don't either. It, just, it, it strikes me that that's kind of the outcome, the logical it's, outcome. And just to be fair, it's contemplated. It's just not easily. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, they are made it differently. It's not. Sometimes it works well. It's not contemplated in our staffing model. Yeah. Um. Or it's not contemplated. Well, in, you know, it, it is in that too. Again, if you don't turn in something, I don't know what you're doing. But the, the, so the, I can't the, fix something I don't know about. But the, exactly, the staffing model would then become. And I'm talking about monitoring and enforcement, which is yeah. you going out. And, months, yeah. Oh, there's a lease up for the, for there. I've got to go and call that guy and say. Make sure you call the the, the town. Yeah, let yeah, them know yeah. that you do it. So it's proactive enforcement, not reactive enforcement. Yeah, that's intensive. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I have a public comment a little bit later. So as an alternate, she's a member. Yeah. You can speak. You can speak. I'm speak. sorry. <laughs> No, 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 you're fine. You're totally fine. It's all me. Um, when you go to parking lots on uh, turnpike uh, rest stops, they have often have uh, larger spaces for, uh, say, trucks or buses. I'm wondering if you're dealing with parking lots in shopping centers, whether to your uh, argument that cars are getting larger, whether we can have slightly smaller spaces very close to the business and slightly larger spaces further away. This would, couldn't be like those strip malls. This would have to be in slightly larger parking areas. Basically. Um, like the Cabela's parking lot or the person like that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the you think you, you think of multi story parking lots all the time have compact spots That's right. versus non compact spots. So I think that could be addressed during the site plan process. That would be very specific, uh, business driven. Like Costco has some larger parking spaces to mm -hmm. allow for their carts and things, and then some, some normal standard. Mm -hmm. I don't think we we removed recently our larger spaces. I don't think we want to encourage more asphalt, honestly. Now compact is good, but I think we all the businesses usually um, would propose that. We do have the ability to do some compact spaces. Um, but, but but drawing back to the standalone versus adjacent yeah. versus those and strips pieces, uh, looking at at. Um, change of use. I mean, I, I think in terms of looking at parking, that's important, but I mm -hmm. think it also plays to our um, planning on specific zones mm -hmm. to say in these particular zones, 
with and there's vacant property that gun, is going to be developed. So here's our long range plan. Here's how we see it right. playing out. It's got trail connections. We need to have an idea about parking connections. Right, right. And um, once we do that, then it becomes easier. Yeah. I think you're, you, we have, we have to think about it in terms of. You're right. If we're thinking about um, through street connections, we're thinking about where the potential maximum number of street cuts can be. Um, we're thinking about trail connections. This just becomes part of that general long term. Right. I don't want master plan is a privileged term, but um, but longer term. Large, large scale site planning process. What our priorities are in this particular area. Yep. Because if somebody can um, figure out how to get there by bike or by mm -hmm. walking, um, you're going to have an easier way of making that happen. It's like the senior um, housing there behind Hannaford's. They ought to be able to easily walk mm -hmm. yeah. to yeah. get to Hannaford's to shop mm -hmm. and not have to go through with a machete <laughs> right. and then climb over the four foot uh, you know wall. so i think it, it's it's looking strategically at some of our particular areas and going back to uh, alan's comment about density is looking at our higher density areas and saying what's our long-term plan here how do we make connections so that as new developments come online or new uses come into play we say okay this fits this doesn't um this is what we're going to have to do I think is if we don't have a longer view out there, it's going to still be the same hodgepodge. With right. That. I think yeah. that's where you're sure, right? Yeah, I think it's going to be really that, that kind of prompts that type of forward looking of like, mm -hmm. what do we want this to be, and right. how does that then impact parking? When it grows up, what do we want yeah. it to look like? Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. we talked about parking by zoning district last time, didn't we? And I still really like that idea because you could eat. There's several. So. I'm a table spreadsheet sort of gal. So i am got like this matrix I'm going to put into place for the next time, I think, where we could look at the uses, um, which we don't have that master use table for commercial zoning, but put that together and then we can maybe categorize some of them to see where is four per thousand really appropriate in these districts. Rachel has her hand up again, um, but maybe we can look at it that way for next time. I'd like that. Okay. Yeah, okay. And and then capture that change of use too as a different, more succinct process. So it's like yeah. you gotta do it. Rachel first. Yeah. Rachel. Yeah. Um the uh the case of Jocelyn Place, um do that. The uh we tried very hard to get and they tried very hard to get Hannaford to agree to cut through that bank so people get much e more easily into Hannaford. Hannaford's point was that that's where all of their giant trucks went. Sorry, exactly. And they didn't want to be responsible for people getting hit by giant trucks going through that. So the question, I think, it's, it's not that we didn't try. It's not that Johnson Place didn't try. We can't, ended up with the best that could be done. So the question, part of the question becomes, what ability is there and should there be an ability to tell a place like Hannaford, I'm sorry, but there's something that is a good neighbor and we need you to come back to us with some alternative <laughs> suggestions or to deal in good faith with the um, the applicant. We. We also tried at Evergreen for a long time to get the diner uh, next door to allow them to go to Diner Drive, allow people from Evergreen to get onto Diner Drive. Well, guess what? Uh, before the planning board at this next meeting is a cut through that allows people from Evergreen to get onto Diner Drive to go out onto Broad Turn. So <laughs> sometimes the magic works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so, in the case yeah, of, that one like ownership. I I'd, I'd love to yeah. give the planning board more of a stick, um, to, to, especially when we're trying to implement something like a a, a, a zone wide plan, where we've got state we we we've got principles for connection pedestrian and bike connections, principles for shared parking, principles for 
um, for, for, for through travel to, um, uh, to things, which um, again, I think the charrette will, will reveal. But once we put those in place, I think the planning board should have an enforcement mechanism, which is not to say it's nice to have, but you say the town has approved this as a part of the zone plan. If you don't have it in here, we're not, we're not approving your, your your site. Full stop. You've got to have a connection. To be able to oh, to tell the other people, the okay. other owner. Sorry, you have to uh, work with these people. Uh, enforcement is a code enforcement. Yeah, no, but the land boards don't have. I think he's once they approve, they don't have. No, but it's in the approval process. They they can withhold approval. They have full. full but it's ability. like an annual review for stormwater. Like you've got to go and do your stormwater mm -hmm. maintenance every year. Maybe you've got to analyze your parking plan. Right, but if a, yeah. if a developer is out of compliance with the approved site, mm -hmm. that's a code enforcement. No, no I'm, I'm talking about. I, I want to. Yeah, but the developers on. I, I want to make sure I'm clear on this. I'm trying to do it. Are, are we first looking at the current? Parking requirements per types of use. Yes. And, and contemplating changing them. Yes. Okay. And then secondly, as I understand, the, the yellow you highlighted, you just highlighted it. That's not in the in what you handed out. You're not proposing to change. No, I just think those are the areas we should look so, at. So so as There's... I understand that if I go for approval for my project and the and the standards say you need whatever, a hundred mm -hmm. spaces. And I say, I don't think I need 100 spaces. And here's why. I have to go to the Board of Appeals. Yes. That's Or put uh, landscaping set aside, landscape area. That yes, that's, a little cumbersome. that's silly, right? Yeah, start the <laughs> manual process, file an appeal. Yeah. It what about the other way? There, to Rachel's point, there is no maximum. So you yeah. could over park it. So, I mean, most yeah. developers are most responsible. There you go. <laughs> they want to have enough park right. for their use. Right. And I might come in and say, gee, I really need another 50 spaces. And I can hear the plane would say, well, that's more paving and all. So yeah. that's a problem. Yep. Didn't you have that issue with Costco? Yep. But but that's not prohibited. Right? No. I can no. always have so, more park. And, well, and, we... and Rick, in the last five years, the zoning board has not had anything come in front of it. Looking for a reduction of so mo yeah, because most yeah. developers look at sure yeah. they hire their design yeah, they want they sure and look at the ordinance and they say, Oh, you need 50 spaces, and they design the, yeah. the site accordingly. They go to the planning board. Once required 50, we have 50 big next issue. But the use, the actual, isn't that the problem with Luna? Yeah, she meets the parking. She meets the parking, but the parking but requirements for that is not good. That's the so the problem <laughs> is really our standard requirements set out in the ordinance. There is flexibility to go more, but develop right. needs in more, and there is a process to reduce it. Right. If the developers, I don't really need all those parking spaces. Yes. So so what we're focused on, as I understand, then is our standards need to be looked at. So we'd like to look at our standards. We'd also like to look at maximums. And then we'd also like to look at um, change of use, how we address, especially for existing, how that right. can happen. And then we'd also like to um, address shared parking and how that functions yeah. for That's a new- That's presumably only going to develop. That's only going to be a problem in a multi-use right, facility. Right, right. Space. But we have multi-use facilities now. Um, the Willowdale area, that facility there, where they have that drive-through, I think it was a bank at one point. Yeah. They came in and wanted to do a coffee shop drive-through, and they didn't have enough parking. They came in and did it right, and we found you don't have enough parking. Um, so that is an instance where the process worked. But if they had just leased it out, the coffee shop was an allowed use, then it's we're kicking out a business, right? And that's not really an ideal situation to put us in either. So we're right. addressing yeah. a lot of things. The, yeah. the minimum, Rick, yeah. is not that you can short the amount of parking. You might not have to build it out, but you got to prove that you have the space right. for it. That's what happened when I was on the fire guns. Yeah. They needed, they needed more parking. Yeah. Created mm -hmm. in the grass over. Yeah. But yeah. It, was, it could support. Right. Yeah. Rachel, one second. Rachel, Rachel's had her hand up.
Yeah, um, I, you know, this is just kind of a wish list. Um, I wish there was a way that the planning staff had some teeth to stop something from coming to the planning board when it's too late. In other words, we get buildings that are lovely buildings and they are too big for the lot. And all of a sudden the the person who wants to build, well, I'm gonna put parking here, I'm gonna put parking here. By the way, I need uh, three curb cuts. Um, and we can say, but if you have a small, you know, if you have a smaller building, you got enough parking. So the developer is gonna try and ha have it always going look for the largest building that they can put on there because that's the profit. Parking doesn't give them any profit. So then they go through contortions and then they scowl and pout when we start saying, yes, but you need, you can't have this or you can't have that. So I, I don't know how you, the message goes out that says, please don't come to us um, with something that doesn't work for the site. Well, I've had that, con I used to have because... that conversation in the middle of a hearing. Rachel, do you mean it doesn't work for the site because the planning board just thinks it doesn't work or it doesn't work for the site because it doesn't meet the ordinance because if it's the, if it's it's the form, work. well, it, the it form means, I mean, the planning means... board can't say you can't put the building there because we think it's too big. What but they're bringing to us, what they're bringing to us, we have to change but our bringing to us what we're a requirement. requirement. In terms really of design, but then really they have no space forward. to do an adequate parking. So uh, then all of a sudden they're saying, well, we put all of this money into the design of the building, yada, yada. Uh, and we're sitting there saying, yeah, but what you can do is you can lease parking someplace. Um, you can cut through to another spot uh, and get more parking. But what you're looking for, for your building, uh, for the size of your building and the requirements that that building, that that size has, you don't have enough space left I see. on the lot. It really meets you on this, but then they say, gee, we don't have room for all the parking for this big town. Then you deny the approval because they don't have enough parts. I, I'm having a little trouble hearing you, Rick, but I, I, think, yeah, exactly. I think yes. I, I understand what you're saying now. I'm just, I'm just yeah. I, I just wanted to say that I think that you know, just like stormwater has an an annual maintenance component, let's just link it. The the link to stormwater is imperviousness, mm -hmm. and and then it becomes as part of your stormwater plan. Maybe you have to identify your parking spaces. This is what your impervious cover is being used for. And you have to report it to staff, so it becomes it's less of an a burden on staff, and it's and it's not necessarily the developer who's walked away years ago. It's the property; it runs with the land. It's the property. It, it's it's the property owner. It's the tenants. They all have to work together to do their annual report on stormwater and imperviousness. Yeah, I think if you're going to, and, and I think if we're, if what we're saying is that parking is going to be tied to use and use has changed for buildings that are permanent. Um, I think I, I'm on completely agree with Rachel. Then let's link it to some other um, uh, annual or regular review process yeah. um, that already proactively reports to staff so that you're not in the role of trying to go and chase down people. They have to file a form every year. But it's limited. It's only certain yeah. developments at once they reach a certain trigger that they have to do these annual. Yeah. Well, and, and that's where I think and we've got to reach out further so that we can have space for bikes and pedestrians and things like that. But if you link it to imperviousness, then we can be like, hey, you like having Scarborough Marsh, right? You like having five beaches within 15 minutes of your house that you can that you can swim at, right? The, the only thing that I have a concern about there is that if you're doing that and you come up with a situation where maybe it was a change of use, who knows? Maybe it was just expanded business. Uh, but if all of a sudden you can't meet that requirement, what's the town supposed to do? Are we supposed to look at a restaurant and say, well, you've got to pull two tables out of your restaurant now because you don't have enough park. Okay? Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. I, what, and legally, do we 
have the yeah. right to do that. I mean, yep. I, I just she won't... goes and counts chairs. Yeah. It's yeah. really annoying. No, I get that. I'm just <laughs> all I'm saying is I I I don't want to put something right. down on a piece of paper yeah, yeah. But the that's property... going to get us in trouble down the road. No, while. because there's a way out of that. The property manager can then go to everybody else in the strip mall who pays their rent that pays the taxes that says, okay, uh, El Rodeo is going to have to take out five tables unless we can figure out bank parking. Yep. If we can use your parking here after hours when you're done. Mm -hmm. I think it puts the onus on the people who actually live there. And you're getting the income. A community yeah. and you're getting the income. It, 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 and that also then allows us clean. The idea that a developer is going to come back and do something yeah. is erroneous. Yes. But, the, but it gives us also the ability to link it to um, the, the the town country or the, the town village. We can link it to the specific zo mm -hmm. the zoning grid itself, mm -hmm. where property owners within that grid yep. have to file this annual report, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Um, and, uh, and 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 then I'm confused about annual report. Stormwater reporting. Is one thing, and so we could yeah, they include on, they report on use. They, they report on report on um oh, on tenants. Think that's gonna go you, you do an what? inventory. No, as part of the report, that's a line item on a form. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's just that. You you, you report but on how you're already doing. It, if you already have a CO for a business, well, I'm just devil's advocate here. Like, if I have a CO for a business and I own a restaurant, why do I need to do an annual report about that? Now, if you want me to do a business license. And you want to start that but, process? But what you just said is the CO maybe that's that. But yeah, sure. But, but, but what you just said is the CO process isn't giving you the planning board or planning staff, planning staff the information you would need to monitor use. No. What I'm saying is the certificate of occupancy process is not always used because some people don't know that they have to do it that's exactly, or they choose to ignore it. Point. How are they going to know they have to give me an annual report? Because they're already giving, the property owner is already giving an annual report regarding their stormwater. Not, ev not, not everyone. Not everyone. It's not, everyone. not everyone. It's everyone. Like new fair. things. But we could expand that. Process. Correct. We could expand that process. And if we're looking at something like a, 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 a no-kill zone or a Dunstan mm -hmm. zone, that's part of the zone process. The zone, now each property owner within that zone Look at Red Brook. Mm -hmm. what, what's the impairment there? Right. Imperviousness. Yes. Maybe we need to update the Red Brook Watershed Management Plan that says each owner must um, describe an inventory there, impervious, a commercial owner, so to speak, mm -hmm. has to uh, uh, inventory and report their imperviousness, the use on each imperviousness each year. And if you have parking spaces, you have to account for who, who those belong to in each tenant. So with Redbrook, you have it mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. With uh, Chapter 500, Site Law, you have it You have it there. And why don't we just say, you know what we did? Just like um, rivers and streams, we said instead of a 25-foot setback, we're going to do a 75-foot setback town-wide. Why don't we just do it town-wide? I guess I'm, I'm wondering if this is something that you guys said to the mm -hmm. Chamber of Commerce to... Uh, like, like what? What would be? We would need to have problem? a plan and then go talk to Seth. Yeah. So I think or we can have we can have a problem statement and then the options and say yeah. which you prefer. I'm I'm leaning more towards business license. Business, yeah, because yeah. we are we starting do. to do that for cannabis, likely yeah. eventually, and we already do it for hotels. Are those the only ones that we do? Yeah. So if it was a twenty five dollar yeah. fee, fifty yeah. dollar fee annual, and you have to provide certain information, it might. Be a simple thing, but that's something I would be interested to hear from Sideco and the Chamber of Commerce on. If that's to me, it's a simple solution. It's very tiny, and it helps us understand what's happening what's in town. Happening, yeah. Other municipalities, you have to have a business license for everything. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Yes, it shouldn't be surprising. It would... I guess I'm trying to. Uh, I'm trying to understand. But we're talking about parking, so I'm trying to figure out like. Business licensing, we would just hope it would help us with change of view, so it's yeah. another mechanism. But we still have to fix parking, like. Uh, and, and I think for the fixing parking thing, I I still come back to. I'm not sure I have enough information. I want to go through the draft license. Yeah. Uh, that that to me is really going to add a lot of context and information to how to can. how this this works do that we, I don't feel like I have right now. Do we keep a parking inventory of how many parking spaces? No. Okay. See, I think so we should we have so far away from we, Portland that we don't have to do that. Portland is expanding and yeah. other municipalities do. Like in Westbrook, where I work, 
we have to have a parking inventory. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it, it's a matter of, you know, making sure that there's enough parking for businesses. Kind of. Like Saco and this. Saco just, just did it and discovered that they've got way more parking places and places where nobody parks nobody and parks. we don't have enough where yeah. people want to park. Yeah, so we don't even have a parking center. No, we don't have that. Park that. Yeah. Park that. Time check, five minutes on this topic. Okay. Can I just, I, I just want to end with, I think there are mechanisms that we can use to sort of start with a baseline parking inventory and then understand that we can maintain that inventory with some type of annual mechanism to, to understand what our parking dilemma is. And I love the idea of going to SEDCO with options yes. that have been... So should we do the parking inventory first to find out our baseline of what we, it, it's hard to solve a problem if you don't know what the problem yeah. is. And, I, and Well, that's my question. Is there like, I need to see a visual well, map that's like right. red. This is green. Because we know we have, the problems that I know we have are restaurants, yeah. a few restaurants, that's a problem. And then we have a lot of empty parking spaces. And yeah. Actually, yeah. so that's a problem. And we can engage SEDCO yeah. and say, hey, listen, we're starting, we're embarking on a parking inventory because we'd like to look at our parking. To understand. Spaces. And then the Charette and Oak Hill, if you look at all of your parking, the restriping idea, what could you actually reconfigure it to get would be really interesting. If we're doing the parking inventory, I, there's no reason why we shouldn't do a refresh of, of commercial property use as well mm -hmm. right now. So what, what are these properties really being used for today right. versus what was on their site today? So yeah. that would be, we might as well do it at the same time. And then the other thing I just say is that you say we've got a restaurant problem. We've got a couple of restaurants with problems. And then we've got Pat's Pizza with access to about 300 parking spaces, yeah. which don't, they never use even on trade Yeah. Um, so, um, so yeah, we've got varying problems, yeah. quote unquote, yeah. for, for that. I, I had a question. Um, does the town allow the use of, I don't know what they're called, I've seen them in other places, but it's parking where there are open, it's like an open grid so that grass can grow up. Um, yeah, so it's, 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 right. yeah, yeah Does the town allow the use of curbless parking? We do in some instances to meet your stormwater, like Luna Cafe has some curbless parking spaces. Um, there's a few others around town. So, um, is this something that you think we should be supporting for, for commercial business? I think we already do. We yeah, yeah, we do. And it's kind of case by case, too, because I know here there are concerns with the salt and things. And so yes. it becomes kind of impervious over time yes. if it's not maintained. Um, yes. So there's some okay. conflicting things there. Thank you. Right to be continued. <laughs> to be continued. Yeah. Yeah. This is great discussion. <laughs> like that's the point of this. You know, do we need a baseline? What businesses and what parking do we have right now? What are we trying to fix? And yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just a couple of like I get a couple of complaints about a few things, mm -hmm. and then other places are fine or have too much or have too much. Exactly. Yeah. I think when when they're fine, they're too much, and nobody cares. Yeah, okay. yeah. I have to tell you, we were at Costco on this past Saturday, and the parking lot was. Yeah. There were people. No, it was full. People were driving around trying to find space. Seven hundred fifty space. What kind of weekend is this? I mean, it was not a holiday weekend. Yeah, or we're, it's, we're stocking up the, uh, the the summer cabin. I guess people are going north and, yeah. and, and going north too. Yeah. yeah, it's the only Costco in the state. So, but it was just and Tom Hall was there. I mean, we were standing it for. Yep. Never what is there. this? <laughs> <laughs> Go. Same big box. This freak me out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do I don't think there is, but is there anybody online for public comment? But no, I don't think so. Nope. Now that we know that Judith isn't public. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Moving on. Staff updates. Let's see. Um, I did. Um, Denise Hamilton reached out to me again about a discussion about the light industrial zoning district. I didn't, when I went back and listened to the discussion last time, I didn't get that there was a, an opinion that we should look at it again. We looked at it when I first got here 
the light industrial district where the beach road speedway and then a little south of that i don't know if there's much to be discussed about that i told her i would ask again but... yeah, I, I, and i i remember that from the last one too and i had to leave kind of happily to her, her discussion but the i think what sometimes people forget when they look at that now is that number one there was the speedway and there was a lot of repair fields around that mm -hmm. um and the idea of that being sort of pristine or rf type district anymore is kind of gone unfortunately mm -hmm. um yeah it's a brownfield exactly it's no longer rural rural uh, um, anymore so um which you, if you're just driving by you, you don't necessarily notice as much um and it also includes the um the um the, the gun club um so the the, the gun club property yeah. that well, that's yeah, not right, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's not that's, right. That's, um, I think it's in the end. It, it's in RF. It's in RF. Okay, mm -hmm. gotcha. Because that's that would require massive remediation to do anything there as well. So, mm -hmm. and the best way to do that would probably have somebody put a logistics. If we if, if we were here, I'm not saying mm -hmm. God bless the good club, but apply for brownfields. Yeah, pardon. I apply for brownfields assistance. Yeah. So, um, but I think that's kind of kind of a, a message for her. Okay. To help her understand why that's probably well, and there is a development already in the process mm -hmm. for the Beach Road Speedway, and so do they have a remedial plan? Yeah, I think they'll have to have the remedial plan. What kind of remedial? Uh, it's FedEx, FedEx Distribution Centers. Yeah. Uh, oh. Going through the site plan process for um, two rod home drove. Does, oh. does the town have um, a municipal assessment pot of money that they could sort of? No, I think they've actually. Um, I'm probably speaking, I probably don't know what I'm talking about, but I think they're all set on what they need to do for it. So let's see. Um, that's all I have, I think. Oh, would you guys like to talk? Well, maybe not. Um, this summer, I want to address food trucks and food truck courts as a use. So food truck court, a lot of communities have those around. We don't permit that. We only permit food trucks if it's part of a private catering event for one specific business. I'd be interested in hearing Sedgwick's thoughts on that. Yes. I know it's it, it's a great idea, but it's also a lightning rod for the area of businesses. I feel that. like yeah, years ago, yeah, yeah. Well, twenty years is a lot of change. No, three years. Oh, <laughs> around around the time when when. The Pandemic first. Yeah. Uh, and I've talked with more, Karen about. Yeah. People weren't crazy. Weird. Well, and, and, but then it just didn't happen. Well, so there's a difference. So we have an area of town that is wanting to do food trucks, like a food truck port, which is the lot plan for it. Sure. Um, well, it would be in the CPD district, which yeah. is this. Downs, the downs. Like if that would be an appropriate location for something like that. Uh, Are there restaurants in the down? Right now, there's one proposed, but I think that they would be. I they'd be great at beaches. I think that a lot of that um, brick and mortar versus food truck um, has gone away because a lot of that's what I've heard from. Yeah, I mean, it'd be great for the parking lot at Dunst, um at uh, on the line. For people on the way to Pine Point and the way to the beach. Um, away money from on the vine at Bell Rodeo. Well, no, but on the vine sells sandwiches, but otherwise the grocery store. So people are stopping from the grocery store already. Um I mean, and there's green stuff there, and there's terracotta. You just that's why I say I think Setco is gonna be part of the conversation. West Western Western Scarborough. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Out there, <laughs> or food trucks? Yeah, I mean, where yeah. there's no zoning that would allow food trucks. Well, um, but think about a place where there's a desert of opportunity. Sure, yeah. where there could be. Okay, anyway. uh, so we want to talk about that next month. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no short term. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a timing on that? Um, on the Oak Hill project? No. No. The budget just got approved to pay for that. I don't, and and I'll be honest, it probably won't happen. And I just got the, any surprises on the budget for the planning department that you're concerned about or happy about, or 
That's fantastic. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Sorry fine. To, yeah. Uh, ask that with John so you, That's great. No, yeah. we um, just signed our contract for our new code software. So I'm going to be deep in that. So that's a whole different thought. So I've been trying to wrap up all of our site plan ordinances. Um, so this is good to have conversation. So my brain will be in some really weird places for the next few months. Okay. John, Dawson? Yeah, so um, yesterday at the Finance Committee, we moved a motion to ask Council to consider a $6 million land bond for conservation purposes. So our current bond for the current property is um, going to be completely depleted of funds. And so this is an attempt to replenish it. So that's going to go through a public process. Um, we'll probably do a Council Corner Live on the land bond just to kind of get more feedback before we make the decision in August. Um, cannabis, we talked about, that's top of mind for council. Uh, we are adding a a business license, essentially. It's not, a, is it a business license? It's a registered registration, registration kind of similar yeah. to say that property owners have to register. Um, uh, and there is a potential that we may also recommend a land use change where we would say cultivation facilities in particular can't be within a thousand feet of residents. We already have that for schools, um, but given we've had issues with um, odor, uh, trying to mitigate that by for any new or existing facilities that they can expand that are more than a thousand feet away. Short-term rentals, I do mention, that's going to be on our agenda. The school recommendations, there's going to be a workshop on um, June, June 27th at the school board where they're the committee is going to share the four options that they've come up with. So there's still more work to be done there. Um, and the Gorm connector, it sounds like we may have a public meeting on that on July 18th. I think we're still waiting to hear from MTA. They're mm -hmm. with the board, their board on the 12th, whether they were going to have it. I don't know what they voted on, but the intent is to try and have a Gorm connector public meeting on July 18th. And then the community center, when are those coming? The community center is coming in August, I August. think. So our, our August 21st meeting, we'll have a workshop on the community center. So there's not going to be any bond measures that we've gone to school or the community center this year? No, not this year. The The three potential bond measures would be the, the fire truck, the police equipment for body cameras, and then potentially this land barn. And so we do have a workshop on our July 17th meeting to look at all ballot measures and really have a conversation of do we want all three to go forward or will they be lumped together or will they be they would be separate okay. items but again i think council may the i would say for all three i don't know how we feel about all three going at the same time so there may be a decision to kind of prioritize which ones we want to send mm -hmm. um so that that's what i anticipate the conversation is going to be is we support all three but should some go in June? Should some not go? Should the um, the land bond? I think there will be a, probably a lot of conversation around the number. We approved six million yesterday, um, so people may want to go up or down. So that that's what I anticipate will be discussed at our July meeting. Just for comparison, what's the price tag on the body armor? I know fire trucks are usually it's one mil one million dollars for five. It's a five year lease, I think. So it's about one million dollars, and then fire truck. I want to say seven hundred thousand. Yeah, it's usually around a million. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. There's two bags. We got the non bond non voting approval because of those that we got to keep approving um, fire trucks. And now the fire trucks are priced above the, yeah. the, the threshold of that. Above the 600000 Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 All right. Um, I'm going to go around table here. Rick, all set. Rachel? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I just want to express my appreciation for being able to speak with adults <clears throat> who are not wearing scrubs <laughs> and carrying medical instruments. Uh, my husband, uh, Steve, was in the hospital for 38 days. Um, with uh, encephalitis, he is home. He is doing well. Um, it is still a long haul, um, but I think uh, we're coming. We're able to to see some positive results. So, thank you. And I'm exhausted. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Good. 
Nothing. Peter. Nope. Zoning board is uh, nothing really new, although we continue to see extension plans. Um, folks are getting variances, but then they can't find a contractor to actually get built. So uh, yeah. that's the issue that we have. Otherwise, nothing more. Okay. Um, I missed the first vulnerability assessment meeting. And what was that? I was there. You were there. Okay, good. You'll up, up, update us on it. Um, but Open Space Committee meets uh, again next week, and I think I talked with you all last time I was here about open space and and making sure that we have the you know the conservation land that we need, and <clears throat> what are the trade offs, and what's considered open space and conserved easement and the like. So we're still on that, but we'll meet next week. Rachel, I, I, Robin, 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 sorry. <laughs> um, I uh, we we you gave that little questionnaire to us. Was there, was there anything else that you needed from us? No, that? I don't think so. Okay, I, just, I, don't think so. I don't think so either. It was just, yeah, what's considered a kind of thing. Okay. 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 Oh, a couple things. I mean, there's transportation. We're laboring on trying to get the plan together, um, continuing to talk about um, connectivity, particularly for um, multimodal. I also attended the vulnerability meeting and there's supposed to be a public meeting presentation in August mm -hmm. to introduce what the, the overall plan is. Um, and the meeting that I attended was really just to introduce the group to what the, the contract uh, entailed. Um, and there will be a ho, ho new, Oh, what? oh, the, the uh, water gauge the water installed gauge. at yeah. Pine Point. Yep. And, and what it does is it does an actual constant measurement of water um, levels. And tidal water? Or? Well, tidal water, but water um, to say that there are three different there's high tide, there's king tide, and there's storm surge. Um, and there are three different things, but when they all come together, like we mm -hmm. had in January, you know, there's a disaster. So what this does is measure on a constant basis water levels. And it was really interesting when they showed the examples to see how much different things affected water levels. Mm -hmm. And to your point, Peter, about fresh water, where you've got fresh water coming yeah. in as well, uh, draining, yeah, that affects mm -hmm. water too. And um, as well as the size of the marsh and where it's going to, as water levels change, where the marsh is going to go. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was kind of interesting. But anyway, the study will not include wave modeling or rivering, term I had not heard with precipitation mm -hmm. increases. Um, they're going to depend on FEMA for that information. Um, but they are going to look at storm intensity, which is getting stronger, and looking at near term, medium term, mm -hmm. long term, in terms of impact on infrastructure, trying to identify in the community what are the primary uh, concerns? So I have a question about that. Did the town or the county ever do a natural hazard mitigation plan that would enable uh, us to get uh, FEMA funds for uh, we? Yes, we, we have. have. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. All right. So I have just a couple of things uh, based on the water that she just talked about. Rick and I are on the verge of having ocean from property uh, <laughs> <laughs> with the new maps, mm -hmm. the flood maps. Um, the only other thing was John mentioned it earlier. I was going to suggest to this committee, since we are long range planning, that if you can't physically see the Gorham, uh, the plant, the Gorham infrastructure that's coming up on the 18th that council is running, if you can't see it or be part of it on the 18th, I encourage you all to go back and at least listen to it because at some point we're going to be involved with the town vision of that area. Mm -hmm. So I think That's it would be good to at least under July 18th. Right. And we had we had the folks who are really um, upset about it come to transportation. Yeah. So they they were quite adamant about it. They had a, a table at the yes, at the voting, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. SEDCO yeah. has been involved. We've had joint meetings with the SEDCO, if you will, of Gorham. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's some information flowing. So, but it's good, I think, that if this committee has at least a finger on what's happening. Okay. And outside of Gorham, 
They don't yeah. go on. Yeah. yeah. I'm getting old, right? I'm missing some of these words. <laughs> yeah, we we have if you're looking for it a, a map version, it is on our GIS online. If you can't find it, just email me. Okay. Yeah, that was actually very helpful. Yeah, okay. see it there. Yeah. So with that being said, I'd entertain a motion to so move to close to, to adjourn. Second. To adjourn. So we have a, a first and a second. All in favor. Aye. I Aye. see that as unanimous. Thank you all. I Thank did you. not mention next meeting, July the 12th. July the 12th is our next meeting. Thanks, and for the transportation committee, you're the 